No. They are woven together in such ways as to be wonderfully, wonderfully inseparable. When she was asked sometime if she would uh, explain the meaning of one of her stories, she said, if I, had, if I could explain the meaning, I wouldn't have wrote it. <laughs> she says, you want to turn fiction into algebra. Find X. And when you found X, you can forget it. She wants to write fiction that's absolutely unforgettable. I hope this is not an apocryphal story, but someone I've been told asked T.S. Eliot a similar question. Would you explain the meaning of this or that poem? He said, oh, you want me to make it worse? <laughs> O'Connor's fiction is not reducible to abstractions, and I'll be doing considerable violence to it tonight if I persuade you that now that you've heard this lecture, you understand Flannery O'Connor and can go about your business. Uh, I'll be haunted until I draw my last breath by that. Thank God. At the same time, I think her fiction has its great power because it has a deep affinity with Dostoevsky. She had not read him as an undergraduate. Remember, she refused to be an English major. She said they were still diagramming verbs sentences and parsing and, and, and um, what do you call it when you do verbs? Um, conjugating. Conjugating verbs. So she went over and had, took a social science major. She later said, thank God it didn't take. <laughs> like a very bad inoculation. And we're going to see uh, she came to have an extremely critical view of the social sciences. But she Therefore, read Dostoevsky. She was enamored of T.S. Eliot. She tried to write out of an Eliotic mode in her early works and finally said, this will be the ruin of me. I'm going to leave Eliot aside. But she was, <clears throat> her whole life, drawn not only to Dostoevsky's um, characters and novels, but to Dostoevsky's vision. Because for her, Dostoevsky doesn't dodge any hard questions. And she was determined not to dodge any hard questions. Uh, most of the time in her letters, she refers to Dostoevsky in uh, quite funny fashion. I can't resist reading this to you. Uh, for example, in 1959, she had an exchange with Marriott Lee, whose father had been the president of GSCW, it was then called Georgia State College for Women. And Marriott Lee was a kind of pluperfect Yankee liberal uh, who was reporting that her mother in her latter years had taken up Freud to reading Freud and Dostoevsky. Well, Flannery O'Connor, with her keen scent for pretense, wrote back and said, if any of my kin take to reading Freud or Dostoevsky in their old age, I'm going to leave home. <laughs> But then she had trouble with her own mother, Regina Klein O'Connor, a wonderful lady, about Franz Kafka's story, The Metamorphosis. This is from a letter. And you, if you don't know the habit of being, get thee to the bookstore. It's the single best book of what I call spiritual counsel. Anyone can read. I tell my students, if you read one Flannery O'Connor letter a night, you'll save your soul. They're hilarious. They're not pious. They're tough. She, at one point, says to me most strikingly about her illness. She spent her last 14 years dying. I can take it all as a blessing with one eye squinted. Yeah, one eye squinted. This is then what she says about her mother in Kafka. Who is this Kafka? My mama says, people ask me. A German Jew, I says. He wrote a story about a man that turns into a roach. Well, I can't tell people that, <laughs> said Mrs. O'Connor. She saw Dostoevsky's novel, The Idiot, 
sitting on her daughter's bookshelf, and she said, what's that about? Flannery said, an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> but in one letter to her favorite correspondent, by far the most important, Elizabeth Hester, from here in Atlanta, uh, she dropped her jesting and said something quite remarkable. She there talks about her immense admiration for Dostoevsky's willingness to let his characters have their head, as we say in horse riding or mule team plowing, that when a character begins to move to the center of the novel and take over the novel, Dostoevsky doesn't rein him in. Uh, my very great teacher of Dostoevsky at Chicago, Edward Wasilek, the editor of the definitive edition of the manuscripts of Dostoevsky's four great novels, said it's just amazing to go read those, those manuscripts and see Ivan Karamazov taking over their brothers K. And Dostoevsky's unwillingness to offer some kind of easy answer to cut the ground from under him and make him therefore lose the battle. Ivan wins the intellectual argument. And O'Connor was, was impressed by that, that Dostoevsky was such a tough-minded Christian that he wasn't afraid to let a character who was inimical to his own viewpoint to have his head and go where the novel led. So here's what Flannery writes. It's hard to make your adversaries, by which he means, of course, her fictional antagonist, real people, unless you can recognize yourself in them. In which case, if you don't watch out, they cease to be adversaries. I don't know if that's what was Dostoevsky's trouble or not, but I suspect it was. So Dostoevsky would impersonate his own worst fears, doubts, horrors in his characters. For example, the most despicable of the figures in the Brothers K, of course, is old Theodore. He gives his own name to the father whom everybody wishes dead. He gives his disease, epilepsy, to Smerdyakov, the illeg illegitimate son. He gives his massive lust to Dmitri. And he gives his deep religious convictions to Alyosha. So he, he embodies everything he believes and everything he doesn't believe in his characters in a way that's completely without any kind of artificial restraint. She was also impressed, I think, with the Brothers K because its basic premise is when I try to teach this novel to my students at Baylor, is that each of the brothers have good cause for wishing old Theodore dead. In fact, at one point, Dimitri says he doesn't deserve to live. As you know, he's an awful lecher. Uh, when his first wife dies, he goes out and sings a te deum. All praise and thanks be unto thee, O Lord, that she's dead. But then he turns around and starts asking forgiveness for the very act of blasphemy he's just committed. And of course, one of those brothers kills him. And what I try to get my students to see that I think Flannery O'Connor saw is that in, o in Dostoevsky, as in O'Connor, Parasite equals deicide. If you kill the parent, who often deserves to be killed, you've killed God. Because for Dostoevsky, we stand in immediate relation to our own parents as we stand in ultimate relation to God. Our parents bring us into the world without our asking. Our parents give us our very lives for ill and for good. Our parents are often as distant and difficult to understand as God is, and yet you better not kill them. They are the source of your being. I think ours is a culture that is parent killing massively massively parasitical. No one cuts anybody's throat. No one sticks a dagger in their back. 
our nursing homes are full of parents who've been killed by their children, stashed away to rot. The average nursing home patient in this country gets one visit per year, one visit per year. That to me is a horror as bad as any kind of statistic about abortion or about capital punishment or whatever. O'Connor saw this coming. She saw it in Dostoevsky. And so if you read her stories aright, you'll see that what often happens in her fiction is that the parent, usually a mother, is indeed benighted, often uh, with all of the wrong social attitudes, especially on race, a woman who is small-minded, a parent who deals in cliché, Rome wasn't built in a day. <laughs> and yet the real culprits, if you use a kind of crude term, are always the children who in some, way, some sense want the parent dead and find ways, usually not literally, but figuratively, to kill them. She saw this in Dostoevsky, and she, I think, came to make it a kind of um, leitmotif of her whole work. She saw also in Dostoevsky his profound encounter with nihilism. That is to say, she saw Dostoevsky also already in the 19th century as seeing what would be coming on the horizon of all of culture in the West and even in, of course, the Christian East as well. Namely, the view that the universe comes from nowhere, goes nowhere, unsponsored, undirected, from nothing to nothing with a brief moment between in which we make up reality for ourselves, in which we socially construct such values as we abide by, usually so as to enable the powerful to dominate the weak. And all that's left in such a world is the struggle or the will to power. And that world is nihilistic. There's nothing at the core, nothing but nothing. And for her, it was built, as for Dostoevsky, on what Alistair McIntyre taught me to call physicalism, a very important term. Not materialism, not materialism, because material is a very good Christian word. If you're a Christian, you believe that our God became matter in Jesus Christ. But when you reduce the whole cosmos to a chain of utterly secondary effects of cause and result, the cosmos then becomes entirely self-enclosed, uncreated, unsponsored, not coming from anywhere, and of course not redeemed by anything beyond it. And that to believe otherwise is really difficult. That's what the universe looks like. He gives voice to that, of course, in Ivan Karamazov, who famously says, if God is dead, all things are permitted. That became the watchword for the whole novel. It takes over the novel, and Dostoevsky lets him take it over. And by that phrase, I've learned from Rowan Williams. If you don't know Rowan Williams' book on Dostoevsky, I urge you, get to the library in a hurry and in a bit of gross self-advertisement. It's published by Baylor University Press, of all things. <laughs> we have, for strange reasons, a close connection with Rowan Williams. He argues there, I think quite rightly, that what Ivan means and what, of course, Dostoevsky means is not that if you take the threat of hell away from the world, people will just do what they want. He's not saying that. That's too, way too simple. If you don't have a God hanging over us, you know, making a list, checking it twice, going to find out who's naughty and nice and send to hell those who are not nice. That's not Dostoevsky. He's dealing with something far profounder than that. Namely, if there is no God, there are no transcendent means by which to distinguish 
between good and evil, between the beautiful and the ugly, between the truth and lies. So that when you kill God, there is nothing left but a universe of utterly and only physical causes which we ourselves learn how to manipulate in certain ways so as to let the strong control the weak. And of course that's exactly where Ivan Karamazov ends up in the parable of the Grand Inquisitor where the whole totalitarian world is anticipated in the Grand Inquisitor scene where people give up their freedom in order to have bread and circuses. I've written an essay about the way in which Ivan's famous phrase that people want nothing but miracles, mystery, and authority are the three essential things for Dostoevsky that people would not give up and still remain human. The second point, though, that I find most arresting in Dostoevsky for tonight's purposes is a scene from um, his novel called The Idiot where Prince Mishkin meant to be the central heroic figure after Dostoevsky's own kind virtually loses the battle to Ippolit. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that, so forgive me, those of you who have Russian. Uh, Ippolit is a um, tubercular man dying of consumption and a man wrestling with the most difficult question, am I just an animal? And I like the man in Chernyshevsky's novel, What is to be Done, who says, human beings trying to create meaning in the world are no different from chickens pecking in the dirt for a kernel of corn. They're just trying to get through the next day by sheer sustenance and willpower. And the whole debate centers then on the following painting. This is by Hans Holbein the Younger. It's a painting which leads Mishkin to declare, why, that's a painting that might make some people lose their faith. It in fact makes Ippolit lose his faith. It makes him convinced that we, as David Hume famously said, matter not to nature more than an oyster. So if you don't mind with, bearing with me to look at that painting for just a few seconds. Dostoevsky, some of you know, was a, a compulsive gambler. He was an addicted gambler. He writes a novel by that title. He was always trying to escape debts, running from creditors, getting out the next <laughs> installment of a novel to try to fend off those um, creditors. He wound up in Basel for a while. He would go and spend long hours every day, Dostoevsky, uh, before this panel. His wife, Anna, had to literally drag him away from this painting because she was so afraid it would bring on one of Dostoevsky's epileptic seizures. And he was prone, as you may do, to the Grand Mall, uh, horrible epileptic seizures because Dostoevsky came to see this is the painting upon which my whole life pivots. I either embrace that version of Christ which was based by the way on a derelict fish from the river Rhine a corpse that's already putrefying that has, of course, a terrible emaciation about it, uh, whose eyes are, of course, glazed over more horribly open than they could ever be closed, whose mouth lies aghast in exhaustion. We don't, there's, of course, gigantic interpretations of this painting that I'm not going to dare get into about the middle finger of the right hand that is almost sliding off the table. 
But what to me is most horrifying about this painting is the navel. The navel looks slightly like a male erection. But even it's not that. It seems to me that Holbein, the younger, who was a Protestant, by the way, obsessed with the macabre, is saying this is a carcass. The navel protrudes because it says we're born to die. We're nothing but smart animals that come to this. Now, of course, our Lord came to that. There's no question about that. You can't acknowledge Good Friday without acknowledging that. But the question is, for Dostoevsky, is that all? Is there nothing else, nothing more to be said? So let's read what Ippolit says. It's on the handout, if you have it there, about this painting. And here you can, you can, you can, you can hear Dostoevsky giving, again, his most, his most subversive doubts and fears to this character, letting him take over. So if you as reader want to side with him, go ahead. In the picture, the face is terribly smashed with blows, swollen, covered with terrible um, and blood-stained bruises, the eyes open. The large, open whites of the eyes have a sort of dead and glassy glint. His body on the cross was therefore fully and entirely, here's the key phrase, of course, subject to the laws of nature. Looking at that picture, you get the impression of nature as some enormous, implacable, and dumb beast. Or to put it more correctly, much more correctly, though it may seem strange, as some huge engine of the latest design. Think about that. Which has senselessly seized, cut to pieces, and swallowed up, impassively and unfeelingly, a great and priceless being, a being worth the whole of nature and all its laws, worth the entire earth, which was perhaps created solely for the coming of that being. The picture seems to give expression to the idea of a dark, insolent, and senselessly eternal power to which everything is subordinated. And this idea is suggested to you unconsciously. Well, Dostoevsky absorbed the full horror of this painting and lets Mishkin voice it in ways that are uncompromising. But he also makes it the pivot upon which his whole life and work turn. He says at one point, when asked if you had to choose between Christ and the truth, what would you choose? Without pausing, Dostoevsky says, Christ. Now please don't mishear me, that's not a pious statement. That's not a smarmy kind of easy believism. Dostoevsky is confessing what T.S. Eliot and all the great writers confess, is that the intellect can take you only so far. And that's as far as the intellect can take you. It can take you to a physicalist universe in which natural causes are inex inexorably at work to reduce us to dust and ashes, to rot and putrefaction. Or, and of course for him that's basically Roughly, crudely put, the Enlightenment vision, as it cashes out, we are, we are elevated animals, and as such to be treated, manipulated, um, managed like animals. Descartes said, my fondest wish is to master nature. Or there has to be an alternative to it that cannot be reached by reason alone, but that can be reached by the imagination. And for Dostoevsky, the heart of the imagination is found in Russian Orthodoxy through its icons, one of which I want to show you in just a minute. But let me say just a word about icons. Um, when I show them to my students at Baylor, they almost without fail say, why have these been hidden from us? 
Who has kept these from us? This is something so unwestern, and not least of all, so unsentimental, that the stuff we've been given is so smarmy and cheap that they can't compare to what we see in an icon. So I try to explain to them